shelter in the shadows from the creatures of the night. Tentacles that slither just out of sight. Dark curses conjuring an endless dreadful blight. Beware the evil that goes bump in the night. Lest you give yourself a fright with Mystic Moon tonight. <laughs> Hey gang, you've got Mystic Moon here, and we're going to do something a little bit different tonight. But first, how are my co-hostesses, co-hosts with the most? <laughs> uh, Very I'm, well. I'm getting tired. <gasps> oh, we need to pep you up with tales of woe, horror, monsters, ghosts, murder, mayhem. You know, all, all of that. them. All Ooh. that lovely Christmas. Stuff. The dad in me is coming out, Wendy, and I'm going to say it. You're too young to be tired. I'm the oldest one in the room right now, so. <laughs> it's okay. We'll get you some meth from the trailer park down the street. It'll be fine. Oh, all right. Ooh, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> uh, serious lo- seriously, though, tonight, folks, we've got an interview with Troy Taylor. Uh, Mm -hmm. It is pre-recorded, just so you know, Troy couldn't meet with us at this time, so we recorded it yesterday afternoon. But throughout the interview, we'll have a couple of breaks, three, as a matter of fact, where us, Mm -hmm. we have some ghostly or monstrous or true crime or horrific tales to tell to warm your Christmas cocktails. All of the above, yes. All of the above. It's only Um, fitting. Curses. Yes. So now my compatriots, do you have your mugs? I do. M- mine spiked eggnog. I see you've got a Ouija. I did not use Ooh. my Ouija. I could. Oop. I got a and it's spiked mm-hmm. hot chocolate. There we go. Okay, nice. A nice mm-hmm. mason jar for your mm-hmm. people down the way. You know, that reminds <laughs> me of the last time I took a drug test. Oh, uh... Uh, so, folks, let's get into our interview with Troy Taylor. You'll see me switching between the video and our live screams, screams, yes. screams. Like I said, we're talking horror Scream, tonight. Screams, streams, screams, streams. So uh, you'll see us <laughs> bouncing between the video and a live. But we're here. Ask questions in the chat. We know all about the book. We'll drop links to the book mm-hmm. as well. And because most of the conversation is about One Bleak Midwinter Night by Troy Taylor. So with that... Yes. Let me get us back to the video. Uh, Bear with me as I cue it back up. Here we go, folks. Here we go. Welcome to Mystic Moon Cafe. You've got Jake here, our co-hosts with the mostest. Merle and Wendy couldn't be here today, stuck in the horrible snow and storms rolling through. Uh, so I've got Troy Taylor here today, and you may know Troy for his paranormal and true crime writings. So in a quick bio for everyone here, Troy Taylor is the author of more than 120 books about ghosts and the unexplained in America. He's the founder and owner of American Hauntings Tours and Events and the founder of Haunted Amer- the Haunted America Conference, which is coming up in June Hauntings 2023. People and tickets are going on sale soon, if not already. And along with writing about the unusual and hosting tours, Troy is also a public speaker on the subjects of ghosts and hauntings, and he's appeared in scores of newspaper magazine articles and about the subject of the paranormal and unknown. And of course, he's been on hundreds of radio and television broadcasts about the supernatural. So Troy, how are you doing? Hey, thanks. Thanks. I I never know what bio it's going to be. So um, I was I was speaking somewhere and somebody got up and said, Troy Taylor is the author of 40 books. And I went, oh, man. So, you know, um, that was an old one. But yeah. Uh, So thank you uh, for that. I appreciate it. So I'm glad to be. Yeah. And with the holiday season, I'm just going to drop Troy has a new book out. Actually, I think it came out mid November of this year. We've got it right here. Very appropriate for the season it's called one bleak ugh, if i could talk one bleak midwinter night and terror and tragedy of the holiday season loaded with true crime 
ghosts, monsters, disasters, and all this other feel good stuff for this. Yeah. Episode. Yeah. It's all, <laughs> no, hey, well, the idea was bringing back the tradition of ghosts and horror stories for Christmas. I mean, they never lost it in England, but for some reason, we just never really got it here. Um, not At least it's not the same. So, uh, I, I thought, you know, our ancestors did it, so we should too. Why not huddle around the fire? And, I mean, it looks like we're going to get a Christmas, at least in the upper Midwest, get a Christmas that's going to be not a whole lot of travel anyway. So why not stay home and, and tell ghost stories around the fire? So that was kind of the idea behind the book. I, I've been trying to do that for a long time, but um, I finally put it into print this year. So, uh, you know, it was a lot of fun. It's um. It was a, I mean, it's a terrible book to write. I mean, it's awful. I mean, it's filled with, you know, people being, you know, murdered and, and dying in fires and all kinds of things. But it was, you know, I guess that's what made it fun, but it was a fun book to write. So, <laughs> well, yeah, I think a lot of people forget, and you mentioned this in the book, it's kind of book ended. It's about when we think about things on the calendar about mid December through i think it's orthodox christmas is like january 5th or 6th mm -hmm. it is the most gangster time of the year for right. ghosts and monsters right. right worse than halloween right i always <laughs> tell everybody that you know to the you know to our ancestors and to the pagans i mean the, the scary time of year started with halloween that wasn't meant to be scary that was the harvest festival and then you know then it gets scary after that you know up until really the spring thaw but definitely through january 6th i mean that was the season of witches and monsters and everything else and even when the church started taking things over they still kept pushing all that witch stuff you know uh, hey look out for the monsters and the witches you know they, they're just angry because you know we're celebrating christmas as this holiday we just made up to stick in here but that's okay Okay, where the witches are all out there. And so it's always been that way, but we just sort of lost it, you know? So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the way I like to re refer to it is like up to Halloween, Thanksgiving gets you plump. Think yeah. about Hansel and Gretel. And then by the time Christmas rolls around, you're too fat and can't get around and you're slim pick. I mean, it's easy pickings. You are easy picking. So if there's, there's a dozen different Christmas monsters waiting out there to eat you, and if not that, if you've been lazy and bad throughout the year, then Perchta will come and rip your stomach open and fill your insides with straw and garbage. So it's such a fun, light, you know, um, a happy time of year. So, you know. Yeah, I, I mean, can, cannibalism is at its peak for sure. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know. well, which so, is, you know, where our Santa Claus story comes from. Yeah. Everybody forgets that St. Nicholas was uh, an actual saint. Um, who was bringing people back from the dead because they were being eaten by uh, a French butcher. So it's, you know, these are stories that we tend to forget about over time. So that's Hans Trop, people. For <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, and that guy had a name. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, no, sorry, that was Pere Futard. Sorry. Oh, yes, yes, sorry. yes. Hans so, Trop, I mean, it's another my, cannibal, but. <laughs> right. My thing is always that St. Nicholas really hangs around with a bad crowd. He really should think about upping his, you know, the people he hangs around with, honestly, from Krampus to, you know, Black Peter to, I mean, just a grim bunch of people. So, yeah, I, I was going to say, we're, I'm about to get into, we're talking about Xmas background. <laughs> we're going to talk about monsters as a season two, but I was like, so you got St. Nick's Day, which is about December 6th. Krampus knocked is the fifth. So, you know, anti Santa comes, whoops the right. kids, you know. Right, right. When they do the parade, Santa, St. Nick, sorry, it's not Santa, St. Nick, yeah, yeah. Is, is going down the street, and who's, which henchmen are he bringing, well, Krampus shows up, yes. Black Peter shows up, yep. Hans Trop shows yep. up, Per yep. Futard, and his yep. wife, Mother Flogger. Right, right. They're right. all in the parade, I'm just like... <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yes, I'm very confused, but you know, we got somebody awful for every, you know, every culture that way. Yeah. So, so when you were researching the book, you, you kick it off with a lot on uh, the, the origins of Christmas. Mm -hmm. What was the most surprising part in your research things? We as dumb Americanskis don't necessarily <laughs> get about. Well, Christmas. I mean, I guess the thing about it uh, for me, I, I, I wouldn't say it's, surprising to me just because this is something i've been 
obsessed with forever. But when I tell friends about it, you know, because, you know, we're, we'll sit around and talk about some of these stories and I'll make some comment about, you know, people talking about, you know, the reason for the season and stuff. And I'll go, Oh, whoa, whoa, wait a minute now. You know? So, you know, er, you know, when people talk about Santa Claus and, you know, we talk about the original Santa Claus was really Odin, the Norse God who traveled around on the, the wild hunt and would stop to graze his animals. And the, you know, would the, he would leave gifts for the kids that would put out hay for the animals. And so then he started leaving it in their boots that they left outside. So that's where our Santa Claus and the stockings and all that comes from. And then, you know, then the, the Celts had their traditions and then the Vikings invaded the Celts. And so they mixed everything all together. And then you had the Greeks and the Romans celebrating all this stuff with Saturnalia. Uh, which is pretty much from December 17th through the 25th, which is if December 25th rings a bell, it's because the church decided to use that date because it was an important pagan festival. And uh, it, they took the um, the story of the god Mithra, who was the god of soldiers, who had been um, born to a virgin, if any of this sounds familiar. Um, and they took the story of the king who died to save his people and came back to life and the rebirth of the sun. And then they just sort of, you know, decided that they should just use all these things to wipe out the idea of the way that the pagans, you know, worshipped their own gods and change it to the one god. So that's where Christmas came from. Um, according to the Bible, uh, Christ was born in the spring, but for some reason, December 25th seemed like a much better time, I guess, because it got rid of the winter festivals. And, you know, I don't know, it's that, that kind of stuff always amazes people when they hear it for the first time, you know, they always laugh and you, you know, you'll see things posted online that'll say, you know, uh, the pagans want their holidays back and they're angry, you know, and things like that. But you know, it, it was, you know, but, but everything changes. I mean, just, just the same way that the same way that the church took over all the festivals and turned it into something else. I mean, the pagans had done the same thing. The Norse had done the same thing to the Celts, the, you know, the Greeks did the same thing to the Romans. I mean, it's, it's natural progression of time. Um, so it's, it's fascinating to see how this stuff got its start and some of the legends and, and the way that, things like witches managed to carry over from the times of the pagans into the days of the church. They just changed the stories of the witches and made them, you know, more evil. And, you know, suddenly they weren't just riding around taking care of the spirits of dead children anymore. Now they were trying to get at the good Christians and stop them from going to church. So people were encouraged to hide their brooms and things so that the witches couldn't fly around on them and, you know, all kinds of stuff like that. So, you know, it, um, it's always, it's always interesting. And, and, you know, in working the way through, I, and I did a huge chapter in the book, working our way through how Santa Claus got started, because that's a lot of really grim stuff too. I mean, you know, with St. Nicholas starting out as, is kind of a non-biblical saint that's, you know, probably more widely known than anybody, but the Virgin Mary. And yet, he really isn't appear anywhere in the Bible because he was a rich guy who became a saint, giving away all his money. And story goes that he was putting gold coins in the daughters of this man who's, uh, he, you know, he was afraid that they wouldn't have enough money for their dowry. So he was giving them gold coins so they didn't have to become prostitutes. And I thought, well, that seems like a extreme leap, but you know, whatever, that's the way that the story went. But, um, you know, he was, uh, it became the saint of like, bankers and pawnbrokers and butchers and sailors and pirates, prostitutes and thieves. So, I mean, this has got, a, which kind of explains, I guess, why he hangs around with people like Krampus. I mean, you know, I mean, you look at it that way, but, you know, and then as I already mentioned, he, his, his big miracle was finding out that these three boys had been cut apart and salted and put into barrels to be fed to people as meat during a famine. And when an angel came and told him about it, he ran over to the butcher shop and resurrected these kids. So that's um, that's quite a story. I mean, I mean you know. <laughs> meat's meat. Man's got to eat. I, I, guess, I mean, you know, but... succulent little kids. I know, you know, I know, right? So, you know, but then he, you know, then he starts traveling around with Krampus and all these other people. But even before that, we had, you know, all these different Santa Clauses and different people and Père Noël and Father Christmas and England, and they all end up in the United States and nobody knows what to make of it, what to call it. Um, eventually, you know, they, they, 
badly mangle a German word for him and turn it into Santa Claus. And then, you know, nobody still knows what he looks like, even though there, you know, there's been some stories and poems and things written about him until Coca-Cola starts doing ads in 1930. And then suddenly we got Santa Claus because now every Santa Claus looks just like those Coca-Cola ads. Mm -hmm. They may not have been the first, but they're the ones who made it popular. I don't care what you hear or think. That's that's the Santa we know is the the Coca-Cola Santa, which is okay. You know, it's it's cool. He's got a good look, um, and it's it's something that we can all relate to. Um, yeah. It's hard to relate to things like Krampus and things because that's when well, now it is now we know it, but it didn't used to be part of our culture. Not really. Yeah. And now it's time for Merle scary story. Yeah. It's my turn. It is your turn, Merle. What's so, your spooky story? So my story is called the Nutcracker, not the ballet. This is about a the actual little figurine of a Nutcracker. Um, when I was talking to you earlier, Jake, I, I couldn't think of the perfect story to tell, but then it was just sitting right in front of me. This happened to a friend. So this is kind of a second word of mouth story. I won't use their name because it's still a, a drama within the family. Um, I'm going to try and tell the best I can. I got the rundown of what's been happening. I've knew about this. It's just, this, this is absolutely bizarre. So here we go. The Nutcracker. You ready, Wendy? I'm ready. Uh, that's good. So my friend's parent passed away in probably around 2013, 2014. And they were Christmas crazy. Every, every Christmas was a to-do, big to-do. And her, her mom, who passed away, collected nutcrackers. And this one specifically was from Europe from a long time ago, like probably 20s, 30s is one of her prized possessions. But it was the creepiest one. Like it, it had like, or has, because it's still around, horse hair on it instead of like, like like on here, like it's more coarse than what you see at Walmart. And um, when her mom passed away, right before she passed away, she's like, you better not get rid of that nutcracker. Because that was, that was the running thing in the family. Once you're gone, this thing's gone. It's too creepy to be around. So the first Christmas that she wasn't there anymore, uh, the nutcracker stayed in the totes. Uh, she didn't. She didn't bring it out for her family, but it would appear. It appeared with the other nutcrackers, and it appeared for whatever reason in her bedroom, which is probably a more personal. Hey, you better display this. So, that being said, hocked it on Craigslist. Person bought it. They paid a good money for it because it's a collector one. Within a week, because this, this is before Christmas, you know, when you start setting all your stuff up, getting everything ready, the person comes back to the house, returns it. Doesn't say why, doesn't ask for their money back. They said, you keep this. I don't want it in my house. So normally, you're thinking Ouija boards, you're, you're thinking haunted dolls, pictures or whatever. No, no, we're talking Nutcracker. So they put it back on Craigslist. They resell it for cheaper because they didn't want to keep cashing in at the, at the 50 bucks or whatever. Same thing. Day after, this person returns it, said this thing is, is possessed. It caused a short in my house. All of my Christmas lights are broke, like gone and almost caught my house on fire. The second I brought this home, it happened. So she's stuck with this. She's like, whatever, back to the tote for you. <laughs> so it stays in the tote. Christmas morning. The nutcracker is back in the bedroom. The tote wasn't even in the house. It was in a shed, like on the property, like storage or whatever. So that freaks the family out. Her husband was like, this thing is going in the garbage. I don't care. I know it's an heirloom. 
but we've had two returns and this thing does not stay in the tote. First, they were thinking, first she thought the husband was playing a trick on him, on her. Then she thought the kids were, but no, nobody was because everyone was petrified of, I'm going to ask for a photo. I can try and get a photo of it. The next year, the next year, this happens again, except they, they, they try putting it on Marketplace instead of, instead of Craigslist. Sold it. Returned. So now, the husband actually... I'm getting weird telling this story just because the, the way she was telling it to me. They take it to the landfill, like the dump, like with whatever their, their junk that they're cleaning out. This thing returns. Like a Ouija board, you know, you hear in the stories, just like that. So now, I guess they're like, all right, mom, this thing can, the stupid thing can stay with the other Christmas decorations. And when they set it up properly, where it's supposed to be, all is well. Wow. So. Go ahead, Jake. That shit would end up in the fireplace real quick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but selling it on Marketplace or Craigslist multiple times and people bringing it back, that's nuts. And not wanting their money back, just get rid of it. Yeah. Wow. I'm okay with the keeping the money. Yeah. Well, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we can buy non-possessed cursed objects. Rental fee. Cash money. <laughs> mm -hmm. <Yeah. laughs> mm. And that's a true haunted object tale nutcracker nutcracker so remember folks should you just be perusing the yard sales garage sales rummage sales in british columbia um was it beware, beware, what do, beware what do the nutcracker mm -hmm. i'll try and get a photo get yeah get a photo and we might take it home we might have to do a mandy treatment on that we i think so do it. okay well folks Let's get back into our interview with Troy Taylor, eh? Thank you. I'm kind of Canadian, dude. Kind of. <laughs> I'll pretend. Here's Troy. <laughs> Here's Troy. <laughs> yeah. oh. I mean, when, when the States, we were still the colonies and everything, the mm -hmm. Puritans were having none of Christmas. Nope. Oh, no. Yeah, that's what's so funny. Every time I see something about... Oh, there's a war on Christmas to stop us from celebrating. Hey, the only people that ever banned Christmas were the religious nutcases known as the Puritans who thought that it was too pagan and too happy, that they don't want happy. The Puritans didn't want anyway to be happy. Um, and so they banned Christmas from like 1675 to 1681. No Christmas because it's just too jolly. So they were, I mean, that's, so that's the only people that declared war on Christmas were the religious people, which makes no sense now when people complain about it. Well, that. I mean, you got to work, you got to well, work yeah, and yeah, there was too uh, much drinking, too much, yeah, too much lazy, yeah, too much laziness, but that that's interesting. So with, with your research on the book and all the different traditions that we were talking about, which one do you think had to be say the creepiest or... Uh, or kind of out of left field for me it's santa started out as a greek guy <laughs> yeah yeah right right yeah that's that's weird that is weird um i don't know I, I i think that when you get into some of the monsters and things i mean that's that's some scary stuff but as far as like some of the traditions go as far as what started where um i don't know um as far as creepy there are are plenty of stories about the witches um and as far as the monsters go you know we don't we don't really have any that are based in our country all of them are brought in from somewhere else but um i like the the some of the fun things like the uh the mary lloyd you know the guys that that wander around because yeah. that that is kind of an american thing because in the 1840s and 50s before we really celebrated christmas the well Okay, so thanks to Queen Victoria, we started having Christmas trees and stuff. But prior to that, people didn't celebrate Christmas at home. They went out drinking. 
and partying and went wild in the streets, went and broke into people's houses, stole their food, drank their booze. They set off guns and rang bells and everything in the street because they knew that after Christmas, you're screwed. You are stuck in the house with your horrible family for the rest of the winter. So you don't want to spend Christmas at home. So that's that was always kind of a cool American tradition that we started it as like a party holiday, like New Year's Eve, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but then, you know, the the Welsh and, 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 and the Canadians kept that going because they, you know, have the Mary Lloyd, which is a bunch of guys who put a sheet over their head with a big horse's skull. And it is the most terrifying thing you've ever seen. But they actually go around to people's houses and knock on the door and then sing about how they want to come inside. And then the people that answer the door have to sing back about why they can't come inside. So they have like a rap battle over, you know, who, but the, <laughs> but the dead horse always wins. And so everybody gets to come in and, and they drink and they party. And the, the Canadians have the mummers which I honestly is a bunch of people who put on costumes with underwear on their head and holes in it and then run around and do the same kind of thing, go to people's houses and put on skits and stuff, except for a little while in the late 1800s when they had to ban the mummy, the mummery thing for a while because people were putting on the masks and then committing crimes like yeah. the purge or something. So they had to stop doing that. Uh, but that's kind of come back again too. So those are kind of that seem scary traditions that aren't um, because we don't really have the monsters. But my favorite monster is the Yule Cat. Mm, that's uh, that's or, out of Iceland, or, right? Uh, yeah, or maybe that which Iceland's got some really scary stuff going on there. But I also kind of like the Yule Goat out of Sweden too. Oh, yeah. But only because it, how it really started. Oh, I mean, yeah. now it's actually a goat and they'll put up the big goat you know, the big wicker goat in the, the town square and you could buy, I've got a Christmas, I got a Yule goat hanging on my Christmas tree and Krampus heads, if that tells you anything about my Christmas. <laughs> but um, but um, we it actually started about with like hairy old men in goat skins that used to go around and peek in people's windows at Christmas and decide if you'd been good or not. Yeah, so it really started as like a creepy peeping Tom thing. But then it now it's kind of softened up to be a goat. But I like the cat a lot. Um, it's a giant cat in Iceland who, if you don't, I mean, let's be honest, the, the, the employer started at telling their employees that if they didn't work hard enough on the sheep farms and get all the wool harvested before Christmas, they'd be eaten by a giant cat. Um, and people believed it, you know, because, hey, why not? And so... <laughs> It's a it's a it's a it's a, a monstrous cat that kind of stalks the mountains and kills people, which is I don't know. I mean, it doesn't really say Merry Christmas, but it's kind of an interesting thing. And they have the Yule lads, too, who are the awful little, you know, people who play pranks on. They go around and play pranks on people. And then their mother is, of course, the, the, the Gryla, the giantess who eats children, goes to their house butchers them up and turns them into stew if they've been bad. So Iceland sounds like a horrible place to spend Christmas, but I, I'm sure it's really not. But based on their monsters, it, it does make you think twice, honestly. So I, I love how everything, now just so you know, this this is a true fact. When I was a child, I was blackmailed into good behavior. Oh, sure. I know many of these tales, as you can tell, I'm six feet tall and blonde, but <laughs> my family's Norwegian. And... <laughs> And so I had a lot of these tales, and I actually had an elf that would stalk us making notes if we were good or bad, and we had to have significantly more good days than bad days. So this was different than – this was an elf on a shelf. This was before that. Cause that's, yeah, 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 yeah. It was Marky, Marky the Elf. Oh, yeah. so that's they kind of stole that idea from somebody else then. It sounds yeah, like. totally. And then yeah, to, to, the elf on the shelf is – I. I'd rather have Krampus. There's something mm. creepy about those elves. I don't, I just don't like them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you've seen all the moon mo that yeah, can't talk memes with like Michael Myers and Jason Voorhees <laughs> slaughtering the, the elves. Yeah. And I, yeah. If, if you follow, I just posted uh, the predator special and it's the predator comes after, uh, if you remember Rudolph the right nose reindeer, all the little sure. elves, the dentist sure. elf and yeah, 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 the predators come for them. But since it's ready. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I like that. So why it's only like two minutes long or something. I I, uh, I don't know who but, made it, but check uh, it out. But we also had uh to keep us safe at night, 
we had Oogalaga the Troll. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I didn't know that one either. That's a good yeah. one. I, I think this was just invented by the oh, I Rice see. Olsons. Oh, I see. So that's <laughs> ah, that's why I had to work. I see. <laughs> I think it was just to blackmail me and my two older brothers. I see. Yeah. Well, hey, as long as it worked, I mean, I, I mean, yeah. So, yeah. Get on. Um, so overall, the book is not surprising, folks. It's true crime heavy. So, yeah. Troy, with, with these horrible events and murders over the, the Christmas season, holiday season. Which one do you think really strands, stands out as the most tragic tale? Oh, boy. Um, well, there are several. Um, I'll give you a nutshell on a couple of them, and then I'll tell you the one that's, that's really um, has been my favorite. I, or, I favorite is, again, bad way to put it, but you know what I mean. <laughs> um, I Everyone, mean, Everyone's morbid that listens to Okay, well, then we're okay. There you so, go. This, the story of the Grimes Sisters, which happens right after Christmas, um, has always bothered me. That is an Illinois story, so I kind of grew up with it. It happened in the, uh, the mid-50s. These two young girls disappeared after going to the movies one night and uh, weren't found for several weeks, and then their bodies were found on the side of the road, um, a road that did get a reputation for being haunted, not surprisingly. And that's that's a really sad story because of what happened to the family and the mother and everything and related to these two these two poor young girls. Um, the Lawson family story from from North Carolina is awful too. Um, that's a story about Charlie Lawson who uh, one day one Christmas just decided to murder his entire family. Um, yeah, everybody but his son, who was 16 and uh, bigger than he was, so he sent him off on an errand on Christmas afternoon to go buy more shotgun shells so that they could hunt rabbits in the afternoon, and then he proceeded to murder all of his kids. Uh, his two, two of his daughters he killed outside, shot his wife out on the uh, front porch, uh, killed his oldest daughter in the kitchen, and then murdered three or two young boys who were like two and four, and then a four-month-old baby in her crib. Um, it's an awful, awful story, and then kills himself, not surprisingly. Um, and nobody knows why, not for sure, why he did it. He just snapped one Christmas day. Um, so that story is awful, but probably the one that bothers me the most, um, and not that that's not horrible, because it is, but the story of Marion Parker it's a Christmas story from 1927, and uh, it's about a little 12-year-old girl in, in California and in L.A. Uh, who was kidnapped and murdered by this 19-year-old lunatic um, who goes through this very long, complicated um, story of ransoms and the kidnap, and he kept sending ransom letters to uh, the family and things, but all the while he's already murdered her and cut her up into pieces and has then scattered them around the L.A. area except for her torso and her head, which he leaves in his car so that he can go to the ransom pickup and her father will think that she is still alive, uh, which is the most horrible story ever. Uh, but the story just kind of has a... Um, I know kind of a bittersweet ending to it about the house where the Parkers had lived um, and, and Marion's eventually coming home. So it's, it's one of those, it's kind of like the book itself in that, you know, it's, it's all these really dark, horrible stories that also I try to balance it out with a little bit of light and a little bit of hope. Um, but, you know, there's only so much that you can give when it's talking about a story like that. So yeah, uh, but that's probably the one that has always bothered me the most as far as the Christmas murders go. Yeah. And now Wendy tells her terrifying tale. Woohoo! Well, all righty. I am not as prepared as I would have liked to have been. I was working on a story and it just kind of kept getting more and more meh. So, so I looked one up. And Jacob will probably get very excited about this one because it's called The Lighthouse. That's, the just, lighthouse. My, that's just my insulin pump. It, it's wanting to be very loud this evening. 
I would also like to say, Jake, thank you so much for um, being able to interview Troy when I got hooked, you know, hooked at, up at the job there and couldn't get loose and, and Mike did as well. So, mm -hmm. so, you know what, I am always down if someone's making money. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. Ain't no shame in that game. <laughs> well, I, I knew you could handle it regardless, but yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. It was my pleasure. Sure. Okay. Let me pull this up. Here we go. All right. The lighthouse. Um, now, Jack was a writer who moved to a seaside town. He traveled around the coast to write stories about the people who lived there. Um, he did not know that he would soon have his own story to tell. After settling into his new home by the sea, Jack decided that he needed some artwork. Um, he'd heard about an old man who ran a gallery in town, and he woke up early one morning and walked to the gallery. Um, good morning, Jack said as he opened the gallery door. He shook the old man's hand and introduced himself, then began looking at the paintings. Uh, the old man had an assortment of paintings. Um, there were scenes of flowery meadows, city skylines, and desert landscapes, but Jack kept coming back to a painting of a lighthouse. It reminded him of the lighthouse at the edge of town. He goes, what a perfect picture. I'll, I'll take this one. Um, the, the old man says, well, I hope you have the perfect place for this painting. And he kind of looked sly, side-eyed, and, and, and didn't say much more after that. So Jack paid the man and walked home with the painting under his arm. He couldn't wait to find the perfect place to hang it. That afternoon, Jack found a place above his mantle. Um, he hammered a nail in the wall and hung the picture, and he stood back to see if it was straight. Um, he, he thought it was per absolutely perfect there. Um, he could look out his window and see the sea, and he can look above the mantle and see the lighthouse. What inspiration. That evening, Jack sat down to read over some notes from the day before. Um, he'd been interviewing a young woman. Um, her grandfather had run the lighthouse years earlier. The young woman told many stories about her grandfather, and he loved the sea so much that he wanted to be buried there. Jack suddenly looked up from his notes. He thought he saw shadows moving across the dark room. Um, he got up and walked down the hall, saw the shadow again. This time he caught a glimpse of a ghostly old man. And he wasn't quite believing his eyes and he, so he rubbed them and, and did, did a big old shiver and then thought, well, maybe I'm just tired. Uh, my eyes must be playing tricks on me. So he shut out the light and went to bed. I'm not sure I could have done that, but okay. That night, he dreamed about the lighthouse in his new painting. He was standing on his platform and looking out to sea. He saw an old man sitting alone inside the lighthouse. Um, the man seemed very sad, and Jack tried to speak to him. That's when Jack woke up, of course. But uh, the next morning, Jack felt like he had to move the painting. He didn't know why he felt that way. He just did. He looked around his house for the perfect place and decided the best place was right above his desk in the den. Um, he figured it would help inspire him to write his newest story. That evening, after a quiet dinner, Jack sat down at his desk to work. Um, he was reading a book about lighthouses when a strange feeling came over him. He got all cold and shivery and, and just trembled as he turned the pages of this book. Then in the corner, Jack saw the shadow again. This time, he was sure it was an old man. The shadow paced back and forth in the room, and Jack could tell that he was sad and restless. He looked around the room and wondered where the shadow was coming from. Then he turned around and the shadow was gone. Um, it, Jack was very puzzled. He began thinking about the painting. Could that be why the shadow is here? Perhaps I have not found the perfect place for it. Jack went to bed that night thinking about the painting and the ghostly shadows. <laughs> and he tossed and turned and, and never did get to sleep very well. In the morning, he finally fell asleep. He did finally fall asleep. Um, he had a dream about the old lighthouse again. This time, the old man was looking out the window of the lighthouse and was staring at the sea, watching the gulls dip and dive. And he, the, the old man looked so happy. Um, 
But Jack woke with a start and he knew exactly what he had to do. He jumped out of bed and quickly got dressed, took the painting down and carried it into his living room. Then he found the perfect place for the painting. It was directly across from his biggest window. Um, Jack loved sitting in front of that window himself. He could watch the waves breaking on the rocks and the sunrise each morning. Um, Jack hammered a nail into the wall. Then he carefully hung the painting. He stepped back to see if it was straight. Then he turned around to look at the sea. Yes, he exclaimed. This is definitely the perfect place. That night, as he worked, he waited for the ghostly shadow to appear, but it never did. Um, didn't didn't make an appearance on the next night or the night after that. Jack noticed that a certain sense of peace and calm had come over his house. And he stopped dreaming about the old man and the lighthouse too. Soon after the strange shadow had disappeared, Jack started working on a new project. He was writing a story about the painting and the ghostly shadow. Jack decided to start at the beginning. He described how he'd found the little house by the sea. He wrote about meeting the old man at the gallery and how he had chose the painting of the lighthouse. Then he came to the part about the warning from the owner of the gallery. I hope you have the perfect place for this painting, he said. The old man's comment made Jack wonder, did he know all along that the painting was haunted? Did he know the painting belonged near the sea? Jack decided to take a break from his writing. He got up from his desk and walked over to the painting and he noticed something he had never seen before. A man was standing on the platform of the lighthouse and he was looking out to sea. Jack decided that man looked, looked quite a bit like the shadow. Then he realized something else. It was the same man from his dreams. The end. I'm sorry, that, that was a little lame. I apologize. But. I liked it. I'm going to have to paintings and lighthouses and people being in on the haunt like the nutcracker stuff yeah. mm -hmm. people being in on it oh, and yeah. not letting people know yeah yeah that's that's kind of dirty pool there that it they is. need some coal in their stockings yes and maybe a sound beating from a von krampus or or mother flogger her too yeah mm -hmm. or frau perchta yeah mm. frau perchta she's or too mm -hmm. All Bobby sorts Gaga. of monsters. yeah, Christmas monsters should be coming after <laughs> days. They'll get you. They'll get you. They'll yeah. get you. Someone's yes, gonna end up as stew. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As we've learned so far from our well, that's spoiled drink. meat, though. I don't know, you know. Well, yeah, I guess yeah. at their age, you know, if they were under twelve, yeah, you know, that's, yeah, that's gonna be that's gonna be that good back bacon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not that I know. <laughs> Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> okay folks uh, yeah. let's, <laughs> let's get back to troy taylor oh, eh? i've got to depart early tonight folks yes. as we know oh. mm -hmm. well thank you for being here with us thank and that you was merle great story you brought mm -hmm. i want to hear more yes mm -hmm. all right we will see you guys soon merry christmas and all of that fun merry stuff christmas happy hanukkah right. Happy holidays. Yes. Take care. Au revoir. I'll see you on Spaced Out Radio. Yes, I'm on hopping out over radio space. Tonight. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> All right. Drop a link for that, Double, too. I will. Double header night. <laughs> okay. Take care, <laughs> folks. All right. Let's get back to Troy. Here we go. Uh, so a couple of my favorite stories, actually. I'm a huge disaster fan, Troy. Oh, yeah. yeah <laughs> well, me too, obviously. So. And... Uh, so one amazing story, which it, which is a very, if you're from Chicago, so I, I lived in Chicago for about 18 years. I went to college, stayed there. I consider myself a Chicago, Chicago, and even though I still, I live in the Pacific Northwest now. Yeah. I mean, the biggest Christmas time legend for me is the Iroquois Theater. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And everyone in town knows this because, I mean, the theater is there's a theater in its place it is right. not the original building right and troy if you'd like to elaborate <laughs> sure. on why that is yeah the uh, the iroquois theater was built or uh, opened uh in 1903 and it was open in november and it had been um 
built as an absolutely fireproof theater. They had all these uh, designs that were supposed to, you know, the 25 exits would would empty the entire building in five minutes. And they had, you know, all kinds of this asbestos curtain that would protect the audience from fire. And, you know, all these fire escapes and special doors and things. And um, they, they opened and six weeks later, the building caught on fire and was completely gutted and killed 612 people. Um, no, now, and to this day is still the greatest dis- theater disaster in American history. And everybody wanted to know how in the world something like this could happen in such a safe theater. And I always say, well, you know, Chicago, the early 1900s, yeah, a little bit of money goes a long way. The people are going to look the other direction. But the theater itself, um, on the day that the, the fire happened was December 30th. It was the holiday break. The theater is filled. It's an afternoon matinee for a popular comedy show called Mr. Bluebeard with a comedian named Eddie Foy. And uh, the theater is filled with um, children on school break and um, a lot of women, uh, teachers, nannies, you know, bringing the kids down and and a lot of families, too. But um, so the place is packed. And not only are all the seats filled, which means that there are, you know, um, like 1,600 people sitting down. You got another couple of hundred people who are standing room, packed into the aisles, packed into the area at the back of the theater. Plus, you've got 400 cast members behind the stage. So this place is jam-packed. There's over 2,000 people in there, and a fire starts during the second act of the show. Um, apparently, one of the lights um, you know, set off some sparks and caught a curtain on fire. Uh, which, you know, not surprisingly, when you, you know, have a, you know, open flames to light your, <laughs> you know, which is why there have been so many theater fires, which was why this theater was supposed to be absolutely fireproof. But of course, everyone panics and starts running for the doors. Now, everybody who made it out to the lobby got a surprise because they discovered that the doors in the lobby opened inward instead of outward. So when they rammed against those doors, they couldn't get out. So they just kept piling and piling and piling. But that should have been okay, at least for the rest of the people who could have gotten out those emergency fire doors. Uh, There were 25 of them. The problem was is that the only people who knew how to work the mechanisms on the doors were the ushers. And guess where the ushers had gone when the fire started? out of the building. So there was nobody left behind. So if they got a few of the doors open, which helped some people escape, um, there was also the problems in the upper floors where people were trying to get down the stairs to get out of the theater, only to discover that the um, owners of the theater had instructed the ushers to lock the gates to the stairs to keep people in the cheap seats in the balcony from coming down to take empty seats in the auditorium during the intermission. So they were trapped up there, but that should have been okay because they could have just gone out the fire exit doors. Now, the ones on the lower balcony were able to get out that way. They got to the fire escapes, got down into the alley behind the theater, but everyone who was upstairs in the large balcony discovered that the fire exits, which were one of the lauded, you know, great things about the theater that was going to help people escape, hadn't, hadn't actually been installed yet. So all there was was this platform with no stairs to go down, about 50 feet in the air. And uh, once a few people got out the door, there was no turning back. They couldn't go backwards because there were too many people pushing from behind. A lot of them fell. A lot of them jumped rather than burned to death. Um, There were some workers in the dental school for Northwestern University across the alley who put across a ladder to help some people escape. Then they put some boards across, but... They only could get a handful of people across that. The rest of them ended up falling into the alley. And when the fire was over, the press dubbed that alley Death Alley because they found more than 150 bodies piled up down on the cobblestones in the alley. But again, the fire had started on the stage. So, you know, it was safe for, you know, it should have been absolutely safe because they could put down the big asbestos fire curtain between the audience and the stage. But not only did it get stuck most of the way down, but it turned out that the curtain wasn't asbestos after all. It was just cotton and hemp and linseed oil. And so it wasn't it was completely flammable. So that just made things worse. 
Um, so with all of that going on, people were dying. Not only were they burning to death, they were suffocating from the smoke. They were being trampled by other people trying to get out of the theater. And later it would be discovered there were no exit signs because the owners thought they were unattractive, so they didn't install them. Uh, the sprinkler system that was supposed to have been installed, um, they didn't like the way it looked, so they didn't bother putting that in. Uh, there was no fire alarm in the building, so one of the stagehands had to run several blocks to the fire station to even let them know that the building was burning. So it was, um, it was just a, a perfect storm of disaster. And when it was all over, um, there were like 275 lawsuits against the owners of the theater, none of which were ever collected on. No one was ever charged. The grand jury indicted a bunch of people, including the mayor of Chicago, uh, but no one was ever charged with anything. So nobody ever paid for what happened. Uh, but as I mentioned, 602 people, I guess, were killed. I think I said 12, but I meant two, because 212 of those were children mm -hmm. who died in that fire. Um, not surprisingly, you know, uh, there's a ghost story left behind. Uh, as you mentioned, the Iroquois Theater isn't there anymore. It, it, was, it was reopened for years as a theater. It became the Oriental Theater, a movie theater, for a long time. But eventually it was torn down. Just the foundation and lower parts of the building are still the Iroquois. Uh, the Nederlander Theater is, is on the site now. But even so, staff members, guests, they all talk about it being haunted. Uh, they talk about hauntings in other buildings nearby that were used as emergency shelters and medical stations after the fire, including Marshall Fields, which is now Macy's, and of course, Death Alley behind the theater also has its ghost stories, too. So, yeah, I saved that story for last mm -hmm. in the book because it's always been one of my favorites, too. Yeah, uh, it's just a fascinating story as to everything that could possibly go wrong went wrong. Yeah. Uh, to me, when I read the story, I'm like, this would make such a perfect, like, reenact, old yeah. school audio drama kind of thing. Mm. But the, um, that's I'm sure true. someone's done it. would done make it. a great film. Yeah, it would great make film. a great movie. I don't know how this has never been made. I just don't get it. Yeah. So for the ghost stories with it, the one that I'm most familiar with is Death Alley and the Ballerina. Or the dancer, I guess. Yeah, the, the aerial ballet. Yeah. Dancer. Yeah. Um, and that's a confusing story because there are a couple of different possible people it could be, like Nellie Reed, who was mm. a pretty famous aerialist of the time. Um, we know she died in the fire, but there were stories about how she burned to death while hanging above the stage. But then there are other stories about how she burned to death but made it out of the theater. Um, and then there's another, maybe another aerialist, and I talk about this in the book, who may have also been the one who was up in the air because some people claim they saw her, but that it wasn't Nellie. The thing about Nellie is nobody even knows where she ended up being buried. She was supposed to be buried in New York in a friend's, you know, family plot. And then some people say she was buried back in England where she was from. And so there's a, a big mystery involving that story, which maybe is where the ghost story comes from. But yeah, Death Alley, though, for sure, is the one that people talk about and experience the most. Um, people who don't even know that the alley is supposed to be haunted, you know, will feel cold spots in the middle of summer. Or they'll hear voices or someone following them down the alley, or they'll hear children laughing or crying or playing in the alleyway when there are no kids around. Uh, one of my favorite stories was always about how sometimes women who are always women who are mothers and walk down that alleyway and will feel what seems to be a small hand grab a hold of theirs as they walk through the alley as if someone is, you know, trying to make a connection and, you know, maybe follow them home, you know? <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. So the, the legend I've heard, um, and I think it was Nellie Reed, it just ramps the horror factor is so sure. she's suspended. The thing she's on catches on fire. She's seeing the fire spread. She's choking on smoke. It's almost like a saw trap. And then the thing that holds her snaps, she falls to the floor uh, where she breaks her leg, she is partially burned as the fire rushes the stage. But by then, uh, like the fire departments come, they've got those side doors open. They're dra dragging people out, and she dies three days later. Is that, yeah, that, that's and, and, the legend yeah. I know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's yeah. That's one of like four. 
It's mm-hmm. crazy. I don't know. I mean, I know it was 1903, but it's amazing that as much as we know today about stuff and the way we're able to, you know, put records back together, I um, I delved, I really delved into this story in a completely separate book, much longer than what I put in here about the, the, the minutia of the fire, a little bit more of that. And I can't figure out which story is true. Mm-hmm. I mean, the the newspapers print them all <laughs> as true, every version. Yeah. So it's like, okay, well, I, here they are. You decide whatever mm-hmm. you think, because I don't have any idea. So yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. we we could talk about the newspapers because one one story of <laughs> Chicago lore. We're just gonna sidetrack here. Just yeah, side-track. yeah, yeah. One of my favorite tragic tales is Adela Langer at the Congress Plaza Hotel. Oh, sure, yeah, and that family, like the press. I, I was just so pr- surprised at how awful they could be towards the husband and Adela. And it, it, it's a tragic tale where they fled Czechoslovakia because of the yeah, Nazi occupation. Head of the Nazis. Yeah, yeah because they're, they're a Jewish family. So they leave, and essentially they can't get asylum anywhere. And spoiler alert, you know, there's she. it's a murder-suicide, I guess you would yeah, call it. Yeah. And, yeah. and then, like, the press just rips the family apart oh in, i know i know. in print i'm just yeah I'm, yeah it's like how, wow i know i know yeah that is a bad one i um i was researching the the congress hotel and going year by year through or actually day by day pretty much through every single thing i could find about the auditorium and the congress the different names of the hotel mm-hmm. and uh, that story is unreal I mean, the way, like you said, the way that those people were just roasted over the coals for everything that happened. And it was just, it's such a tragedy, but the press could have cared less. They yeah. just wanted to paint them as these awful people. Mm-hmm. And um, I, mean, for, I mean, for those who aren't that familiar with the story, uh, you know, as, as Jacob said that the, um, you know, they, it, it was a murder-suicide and the children are, are alleged to haunt the hotel now. Uh, the floor that they, I don't want to spoil too much of a story, mm-hmm. but uh, mom grabbed the kids, jumped out the window. And so the kids now haunt the hotel from the floor where this happened. And um, it's, uh, you wouldn't believe how many deaths have occurred in that building. It was like an I mean, Agatha Christie. No. It is. It is insane. Again, that would be, I, you know what? You couldn't even, you couldn't even write a, a movie about it. People wouldn't believe it. Mm-hmm. They, they would They would say it was too far over the top. It's so many murders and suicides and bizarre things that happened in that theater. I, I didn't even know where to stop. It was so insane. You know, it's like, okay, I, I, who's, no, no one's even going to believe this. I yeah. mean, it's this much. But, yeah, it's a fascinating place, but that's a, that's a horrible story yeah. that comes out of it. But, you, yeah, you're right. You can't take the – especially the, <laughs> the Chicago, Chicago. <laughs> time. You know, back in the, in the early 1900s or even, even a little before, there were so many newspapers covering everything. I mean, th- I mean that's the reason that, you know, people like Al Capone are, are seen as like this antihero now. This guy was a scumbag. I mean, you know, a, a, you know, a murderer who ordered the murders of hundreds of people. And yet we look at him as this, you know, this clever guy who, because that's the press turned him into, oh, he's just giving people what they want. You know, mm-hmm. uh, I mean, it's, it's the, the Chicago press is, is unreal. So yeah, yeah the, the, it's, it's no surprise that there are varying, you know, versions of pretty much every story. <laughs> I mean, so this is this is why I tell everyone about uh, Capone, because uh, you're right. He, there's a lot of glamour around him. Like, oh, sure. look, the guy banged a hooker, got syphilis, <laughs> went crazy, and died. Yeah, yeah. That's what happened to Al Capone. Yeah. And a lot of his henchmen either shot or they killed themselves on train tracks in the suburbs. Yeah, I mean, yeah. That's <laughs> yeah. About it. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know. I know. It's crazy. Uh, and now here's Jake's spooky spin. <laughs> Hi, folks. So I'm up with the next ghostly tale. And this is a true ghost story that comes to me from my home state of Wisconsin. And for this story, it takes about place this time of the year back in about 2017, 2018. So in the story, it takes place 
um, the main character, Charlie. And he's just pretty much your average, average guy. Grew up in Wisconsin in lacrosse. He works for the University of Wisconsin system. And at this time of the year, and it's about this date, he was in Madison, Wisconsin. And the reason for that was computer upgrades. So during the Christmas break for the students, he trained at UW-Madison on how to upgrade the computer systems. But he lived in La Crosse. So if you don't know where La Crosse is, it's about a two and a half, depends on which road you take, a two and a half, three hour drive from Madison towards Minnesota. It's halfway up the state, right on the Mississippi River. And he does the training and he's really eager to get home because he's got a little girl and her name's Claire. And on December 23rd, it was going to be her fifth birthday. So, you know, that's a pretty, that's a pretty good one. And be, he's a good dad. He knows even though you've got a Christmas time birthday, it doesn't mean you blend the holidays. Your birthday's your birthday and Christmas is Christmas. So he's gone out to the malls in Chicago. Uh, sorry, we can slip of the tongue, right? We're just listening to Chicago in Madison to go to the toy stores to get her the best stuff for her birthday and Christmas. So he packs them up and he's got a Toyota, Toyota Highlander. If you know what those are, that's, that's what he drives. And he's heading, you know, he pulls out his, his phone, right? Everyone's going to use Google Maps, punches in and sees that there's been some car accidents on I-90. I-90 is the normal way you would go to La Crosse from Madison. But because of the delays, it was going to be more than a three-hour drive. And a snowstorm had started, but this, this isn't your blizzard whiteout that you hear about. It's just the big fluffy stuff is falling down. But it's, it's, there's a lot falling down, but you know you don't have to worry about getting blown over by it by any means. So he packs up his car. You know, he had some coffee with his colleagues in the morning, and now he's on his way back home. And to do that, he's going to take Highway 14. And if you don't know anything about that part of the state, uh, Highway 14 goes through this area called the Driftless Zone, and it's Blufflands. So you can imagine as you're driving along the road, you have these up to like 600 foot cliffs, uh, sandstone or limestone cliffs that just jut up straight up. So they look bigger than they really are, to be honest. But it's a heavily forested rural area where he's going to go through. So he leaves and he's driving through Highway 14. If you know the area, you take Madison to Spring Green and then you head northwest along Highway 14. And so he's driving and he's thinking about, great, I got to get some time to pack up the gifts and stuff because, you know, by the time I get home, I'm not going to have much time to, to uh, wrap the presents, both birthday and Christmas presents and stuff. So he's driving, and as he gets close to this town, it's called Reedstown, it's about halfway through it, he's, he's driving along and there's a big bend in the road, and as he's going around the bend, out of the corner of his eye, he sees like someone is sitting in the passenger side seat, like a young man, and he looks, but he, as he goes around the bend, he sees something in the road. And so he grabs the steering wheel and he step presses down on the brakes and he starts to turn. But like I said, it's been snowing pretty heavy and, and the road looked pretty clear, but it's like he lost the traction on his car and it spins and he hits a buck that was in the road. And so the deer hits the car, slams on the roof, his head goes into the windshield and the last thing that Charlie can really remember is he's going forward. The antlers are coming in. The airbag, like the last thing he remembers is just seeing the points and the airbag shreds because the antlers hit it and popped it. And he blacks out. So when he wakes up in the car, it's on its side. Okay, so it's on the passenger side. So he's kind of hanging to the side. The seat belt held, thank goodness. Because most likely with the spinning, he would have gone through and the deer isn't in. The, the deer had been jettisoned, I guess, from spinning or whatever happened with the car. And he's just hanging there and his head hurts. And he's bleeding and he can't move his right arm. 
and he's thinking he, he can't reach his phone you know because the gps thing you got your phone you can plug it into the air conditioner thing he can't because he can't move his arm and his left one is too far away and he's hanging to the side and even though it's about four in the afternoon at that time of the year right it's winter solstice it's wisconsin it's getting pretty dark but his lights are still on and he can hear the wheels spinning on his car and he sees with the lights and even though the snow's coming down he can see two legs in front of him someone is standing there right in front of him and they approach but his ears are ringing he racked his head pretty hard so he can't he can't really hear but this young man approaches and it kind of reminds him of the person that he just saw sitting in the passenger side before for the accident and the young man comes in and he, it's kind of fuzzy but he's got dark hair and he's kind of pale skinned pink cheeks though he remembers that and the young man says call me adam and if you'd like to come with me you can I'm more than happy to take you. But to Charlie, he's like, I don't, can you reach my phone? Can you help me get out of my seatbelt? And Adam is very clear. I cannot touch you unless you want to come with me. And then Charlie blacks out. He, a little bit later, he wakes up a bit of vertigo. He's still in the car. And he's hanging, still hanging, he can't use his arm. And he sees Adam again, but he has someone with him. And as they approach the front of the car, he can see there's a woman with him. And, and she's probably in her 40s, maybe early 40s. She's got a brown bob. She's got a little bit of gray hair. She's wearing one of those brown kind of cable sweaters with her, like you would see you know, like a school teacher or librarian wear that would they would wrap on. But he recognizes her and it's his mother. And so Adam is there with Claire. And if you remember his little girl's name is Claire named after his Charlie named after his mother. And Adam's like, would you like to come with her? She's she's been expecting you. Would you like to come? And Charlie He's just like, my, my mother died when I was 16. She had cancer. Why? I, I need to go home. I can't. I don't, I don't want to leave. Can you help me out? Can you? I can't get to my buckle because, you know, your buckle is going to be on the opposite. His would be on his right side. He can't move his right arm. And Adam's again, it's like, no, I cannot touch you. And Charlie's head starts to spin and he blacks out again. A little bit later, and again, it's all very blurry. He can feel this wet, warm tongue on his cheek. And he wakes up and he sees a black lab just in front of him. And it's got a red collar and he can see on the bone tag says Dustin. Charlie's like, what, what's going on? And Adam is there again. And he's like, you know, you always love to play fetch with Dustin. You can always play with Dustin if you just come with me. And he's like, Dustin died the year after my mom. It was his black lab. He'd always, he loved that dog. And here's the pooch in front of him with Adam. But again, Charlie's like, I just, I can't do this. I've, I've got to get home. Uh, it's really hard for me to breathe now. Can you, can you grab my phone? Can you let me out? And Adam says, no, I can't touch you. And Charlie passes out again. So for the last time, Charlie wakes up and it's Adam at the front of the truck, lights on him. And he can see Dusty there, Dustin, his dog. He can see his mother. And he can see what looks like his grandparents 
and some more people behind them that look familiar. And Adam's like, Charlie, the window's closing. Do you want to come with us? Otherwise, we'll be gone forever. And Charlie's, he's like, I, I've got my daughter. I, I've got to go home. Can you just let me out? Just let me out. Let me call 911. And his head's spinning. And he's like, no, I can't. I can't go with any of you now. And he passes out. It's kind of indeterminate from this period. But the next thing Charlie knew, there were sirens and bright lights and people running all around the car. And he heard a crank and a whir. And he started to slip out of his seatbelt. And he felt someone grab him and pull him up. And it hurt like hell because they were under his arm. And he gasped. And he just remembers a sleeve going around his neck to hold it still, an um, air, air mask over his face and jiggling and joggling as he's put in the back of an ambulance and taken, driven to nearby Viroqua, which is just a few miles away to a little hospital to patch him up. And, and then he just remembers waking up at the hospital in La Crosse out of all that. So when the accident happened and that buck came through the window, he hit his head on the side, uh, on the driver's side. He hit his head on the steering wheel. The deer's antlers jabbed him in the face and one punctured his arm there. That's why he couldn't move it. But the car spinning around, the deer was flung off of it. And it was there, was just in the road. But his car had gone in the ditch. And though he would miss his daughter's birthday, and he would miss Christmas. I mean, with the experience he did, he did heal eventually. And he was asking everyone, did you see the footprints? I mean, there were so many people that came to see me, but who did anyone see? Did anyone try to help me before it was the, the snowplow guy that does the sanding? He found him and called it in. And it turned out this period with him in the car was only about half an hour. There, there was an, there, the plow came along at that time and saw him. And they said there were no footprints in the snow. It was just your car, the deer. It was pretty clear. You might have hit some black ice or something that had been on the road and you turned too sharp. It was pretty much just an accident. And you know, so Charlie comes home around New Year's and he heals up and stuff. What's interesting is uh, that summer, he has to go back to Madison. Uh, sorry, take that back. He's actually going to Spring Green to visit some relatives, which is, you know, that's where you turn. And as he's going down Highway 14, because that's the route you take, but he's on the opposite side going southbound, he sees a roadside memorial. And there's a bicycle, bicycle wheel with some flowers and a cross with a little picture. A young man named, by the name of Adam Belga had been hit by a drunk driver while he was cycling about half a mile from where he had the accident. They never found the driver of the car, so they're assuming it's a drunk driver. Um, and Adam was 22 and a student at UW Platteville studying animal science. And he may have been ghost that tried to take Charlie home to his relatives for, uh, for Christmas that year. Wow, that, that's a very powerful story. So I did a little more research into this type of ghost because you know me, I like to look these things up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, so this means Reddit folks. Uh, there is a group of spirits called Reapers. They're not like the Grim Reaper but they're mm -hmm. just spirits that are left with a task to help people move on. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you're given a choice, apparently, sometimes you're not. And in the case of Charlie, he had that choice, but he declined it. 
And that's what I can tell you. That's my that's my Christmas time story. Oh, good one, so, Jake. Thank you. So, with that one, folks, if you're still watching and listening, let's uh, let's get back to Troy Taylor, eh? Here we go. Okay, let me go find that video. <laughs> <laughs> and here we go. So, with with another Christmas thing, this is a great thing. Let's talk about Christmas, <laughs> Chris, Christmas tree logistics here. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah so, which again, one of those things most people don't know. Yeah, you know they don't know that you know we haven't always had Christmas trees. People don't realize that. So, I mean, you know, they started out as as a as a you know a Celtic and Nordic thing, but in America, there were no Christmas trees before the late 1840s. It's not that we didn't have evergreens. Well, not in Chicago, because Chicago was built on a swamp on the edge of Lake Michigan. So in the 1840s, when Queen Victoria adopted her husband, you know, um, Prince Albert's traditions from Germany of Christmas trees and put one up at, at the, the castle in England, and then people got a load of it, everybody wanted one. Well, when the craze hit Chicago, everybody wanted Christmas trees, but there was no place to get one because they just don't grow there. So years later, in 1887, these two brothers, August and Herman Schooneman, decide that, wait a minute, we know how we can get Christmas trees. Let's get some boats, go up to the north side of Michigan, harvest a bunch of trees, bring them back to Chicago and make a fortune which is what they started doing, and it became a Christmas tradition uh, of the Christmas tree ship. Now, the thing you got to remember with this story is that these ships were not built to, you know, haul Christmas trees. They were just schooners that had been charged or had been built to haul coal and things around the Great Lakes, and these guys wanted to, you know, keep their budget as low as possible, so they bought the junkiest, most run-down crappiest boats they possibly could at a for a song and because they figured i'm only going to use this thing for you know once a year you know to haul christmas trees so we don't want to spend a bunch of money on it and the other thing to remember though is that they were taking these boats up in mid to late november to the north part of lake michigan um, at the worst time of year for the Great Lakes. By then, no one was sailing on the Great Lakes because it was just too dangerous. Uh, but these guys figured it's only one trip, we're going to do it, and off they'd go in these leaky, horrible boats. And it, it went on, and it became a family business. I mean, it took off, and people were, you know, would flock down to the Clark Street docks to get their trees when the Christmas tree ship would come in and all kinds of stuff. Well, finally, in 1910, this is where the story really takes a turn. Um, the brothers bought a new schooner, the Rouse Simmons. Well, new, new to them. It had actually been built back in 1868. Yeah, that's, that's how old it was. And it's made out of wood. And it was said <laughs> that it was said that when they brought this thing to dock, that the boat had deteriorated so rapidly that even the rats had deserted it. They wouldn't even stay on it. It was that bad. Rats have this, that's one of the, those sailor superstitions. If you see rats leaving your ship, you don't want to get on it because it's bad news. And that's not even a superstition. That's just common sense because rats seem to have a sense for this kind of thing. But anyway, in November of 1912, they took the Rouse Simmons um, up to Michigan, loaded it up with a, tens of thousands of trees and, and started heading back to St. Louis or St. Louis, good grief, heading back to <laughs> Chicago and somewhere along the way just disappeared. They never came back. They never made it back. Um, eventually, the only things found, there was a message in a bottle that was found that said something like, help me. Uh, I mean, not, not exactly, <laughs> but close to that, you know, hey, we're, our boat's going down. Uh, God save us all. Um, they found uh, uh, Herman Schuneman's uh, wallet with papers still in it um, floating, and they found a bunch of broken Christmas trees. So they just assumed that a storm that had come up had sunk the ship. Uh, eventually, they found the ship uh, not far from Milwaukee in 1971. Some divers found it, and that's where it had finally gone down. But um, the, the stories of the Christmas tree ship uh, in Chicago, though, it was such a, a big deal to the city, and people were so upset and, and sad about the tragedy that 
um, the family ended up getting like pieces of Christmas trees and turning them into wreaths and people paid extravagant amounts of money because they knew this is the only way to support the family. But the daughter and the wife and, and some of the family members ended up keeping the Christmas tree ship alive until 1938. Um, another ship was donated for them and they kept the business going. But um, the Rouse Simmons itself though is, uh, and I know that this is what appealed to you about this because we were talking about this before we started recording about where you used to live and where you grew up. But the Ralph Simmons is is one of the famous ghost ships of the Great Lakes, at least of Lake Michigan. Over the years, people have seen it uh, traveling covered in ice, you know, draped in ice, uh, disappearing into the fog and the mist. And they've seen it from shore. They've seen it from other ships. And people are supposed to recognize it because of the smell of pine and the, you know, the, the fact that the ship is covered in ice and uh, it just kind of disappears into the lake. So it's one of those stories. And there's another story that's, that's I think is kind of silly. So I didn't include it in the book, but they no. say that, I know, they <laughs> say that um, the, the cemetery where, um, Captain Schooneman's wife is buried and where his gravestone is, even though they never found his body, but it's got a Christmas tree etched on it. Uh, they say that if you go out to the cemetery, uh, that you will, even though there are no pine trees around, that you'll be overwhelmed with the smell of pine needles, mm. uh, which I think is silly. So I did <laughs> include it in the book, but so there's a bonus for you, even if you read the book, <laughs> there's another story. Oh. Great. I was going to say with the Great Lakes. Um, so, folks, I grew up in Superior, Wisconsin. So up by Duluth, you know, practically Canada. Yeah. yeah. And, and the one thing it's like, really, the ships get off in mid-November. They're like they go and they dock because the storms are so intense when they those winter storms come down. Like the big one, what was it, the in 1913, like November 16th, somewhere around there, was yeah. like the storm of the century that sank right. 40 ships. But like they're inland seas. The waves get 20 feet or higher. Oh, oh yeah. And that, that schooner thing would get flipped, especially with all that. It would list and flip. Yeah, with all that weight, uh, yeah. it was you know it had to be top heavy, and mm -hmm. it was probably leaking. And you know this thing was a floating pile of hot garbage anyway. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was so old and so falling apart um, that it was dangerous as it was. And so they didn't have a prayer once they got hit by the storm. Yeah. So and there's microstorms that pop up across the Great sure. Lakes. Like my favorite ghost ship story is for the SS Bannockburn. And it just went out, uh, I think it was another November foundering. And there was just a quick storm that formed. It was filled with grain. It shifted to one side. The ship listed, got hit by a wave, flipped up, and right down, you know, right down she went. It was like, you know, a 1500 yeah. ton, one of those steel. Yeah, like, like the Edmund Fitzgerald. So. Yeah, yeah, not as big. Yeah. That's but, the one that everybody knows. Yeah song but you know yeah. same thing though november they were out yep. in november and it i mean that that song is based on a true story mm -hmm. so it's you know and it, it's also one of those ghost ships so mm -hmm. yeah there's a lot of them up there and this is why yeah <laughs> yeah it, storms, it, it, you know? it, you're not lake. supposed to be on the lake in november yeah period. yeah, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> just leave it at stay that. out of that water yeah. people it's kind of like the iroquois <laughs> theater i mean they knew better yeah, but, yeah. you know they packed people in there anyway and just figured you know hey it's what could fun. go wrong? What? You know, <laughs> same thing with these boats. You know, it's ah, it's only one trip. We'll be fine. Yeah, so. that's that. That's the case I use for like the final destination opening scene. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> um, so Troy, let's let's step back here. I mean, what what got you into the creepy paranormal stuff and writing about it? Uh, honestly, it's just it, uh, it's been something I've been interested in my whole life. Uh, my, uh, my family, uh, was Irish. My great grandfather was a cop, uh, like a walking stereotype. <laughs> uh, but you know, and so he would always tell me stories and uh, ghost stories and crime stories and things. And so, you know, I, I just kind of had this fed into me my entire life. And I, I actually recount a story in this book about what got me interested in like Christmas tragedies. And because I grew up in a small town in Illinois and we had a coal mine. And, um, and, you know, in the 1930s, and there was a disaster on Christmas Eve and killed like 50 some guys. Well, that was a small, it was a small town. And 
50 guys, that was like every family in town had somebody in that coal mine who died, including a lot of friends of mine who, you know, whose whose parents and grandparents, aunts, uncles had been immigrants who worked in the mine. And, you know, they would always tell stories about how at Christmas time they would have visitations at, at their home from these relatives that had died in the mine disaster. And so that kind of got me interested in at least the disasters and stuff. And then, you know, um, I just, I, as I got older, I, I, I got an interest in, in ghost stories and true crime and history that I'd always had. And uh, so I started writing about it and doing tours because I thought, well, this beats having a real job. And so um, I just turned this into a job. And so we, I've been doing it ever since. Um, in 2023, this will be my 30th year of doing tours and, and writing and things like that. So, um, you know, it's it's just um, it's part of my personality. So, I mean, it's, it's what I do. It's my day job. This is what I do every day. And uh, I, I, I love what I do. So it's, it's not, it's not a real job. I, I understand that. Uh, but it's as real a job as I'm ever going to have. So, I mean, at this point I'm unemployable by anybody else. So <laughs> I have to keep doing this, but that's okay. Cause I like doing it. So we're good. So, so let's talk about other authors. I mean, who, who was a big inspiration for you as a kid? I know I was Chris Claremont of the uncanny X-Men cause I was a comic book reader. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get that. So, um, well, I, you know, I think I started reading Stephen King when I was in like sixth grade. Uh, but even before that, there was this guy, oh man, I should have known you'd ask me this and now I can't, his, <laughs> his name this was, was, his name was, um, Richard Weiner. And he, he only wrote a handful of books, uh, but he wrote a book called Haunted Houses, one called More Haunted Houses, one called Houses of Horror, and I don't know, something about the Bermuda Triangle or something, which I didn't really have much interest in. But um, these books came out when I was like 10 or 11, and uh, I just ate them up. I mean, and as the years went by, I found a lot of the famous stories that he wrote about that they were completely inaccurate. But I, you can't blame people who are writing about this stuff in the 70s because they don't have the access to, you know, historical research and newspapers that we have now. So you'd find, I find a lot of mistakes now. But when I was a kid, man, these were the best stories ever. Um, when I was about 11, uh, my family went to New Orleans and I made my mom take me to like every house he wrote about in the book, you know, so I could at least see them from outside, you know, and I think that was kind of one of the things that, 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 that hooked me, at least as far as that stuff goes. And as I got older, I discovered people like Harry Price, the, the ghost mm. hunter, and, you know, and things like that. And um, so, yeah, that's, that's kind of what set me into what I do, you know, is, is stuff like that mixed with a lot of Stephen King. So, you know, I was already, you know, reading things that, you know, I probably shouldn't have been reading at the age of 12, but <laughs> You know, I remember doing um, The Exorcist for a book report when I was in the seventh grade, um, and um, that did not go over well yeah. uh, with my teacher. But, you know, hey, uh, at least they knew I was reading because mm. uh, I was a voracious reader. So they at least knew that I was reading books, you know, yeah. and I still remember being in like English class and, um, you know, uh, people were would have to give like an oral book report and they would, the teacher would set aside one day you know, out of, um, you know, uh, one day out of the uh, every week or so where people could read whatever book they were working on for their library thing. Well, Jesus, I'd read 10 books since then. So when I'd come up to give my oral report, she'd just go, okay, let's listen. What are you reading now? Because I already, you know, these people, I'd see the people with the same books for like nine weeks, you know, one book they would still reading, you know, and she knew that I'd read tons. So she didn't even, I just, okay, mm. hey, go sit down. You know, it didn't matter what it was. She knew I was reading. So um, I, that's what I always tell people. If you ever want to write, the best thing that you could do is read, not so that you can, you know, copy other people or, or be influenced too strongly, but at least know about reading. Because I mean, I didn't, I didn't enroll in writing classes. I don't have a degree in English or anything like that. I learned to write by reading and, you know, trial and error and, and having people who weren't afraid to tell me, dude, you got to fix this, you know? <laughs> and so I, and that's okay, you know? And so it's, um, it's, you know, it's worked for me after all these years. And I, I honestly couldn't imagine doing anything else. And if I can't, for some reason I can't write, I would go into like withdrawals anyway. <laughs> so it's not even like, even if, if no one even read the books, I'd still have to write something because it's just, 
you know, you have to, you know, mm-hmm. that's just the way it is. Now, do you have any particular process you use? Um, well, you know, I write a lot of books um, because I always have usually three to five projects going all at the same time. Oh, now, I don't I don't finish all of them. I I have I keep this I keep a list of, of everything that I want to do. And then everything will be in varying stages of completion. Like I just started doing some reading about this topic. Um, and then another one, I've already been digging up newspaper articles and finding research on stuff. And then there'll be another one that, you know, this is what I feel like I really want to do now. Uh, so that's what I finish. That's what I go full bore on. And then I'll spend another couple of days messing around with other projects. So I've always got something happening, you know, um, but I'm I'm also doing like working on presentations for our dinner and spirits things. I've, I've got a podcast, got to write scripts for the podcast. So I'm, I'm writing and writing and writing every day. I mean, that's, that's what I do every single day. If I'm in the office, I'm writing something. So, you know, <laughs> of some kind, you know. So. Okay. So it's, it's more, I guess they call them pantsers. You got plotters and pantsers. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Pantsers yeah. are like, here's my idea. I'll just start going and we'll yeah. see what happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's, 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 that describes it pretty well. Okay. Yeah. Stephen King's yeah. a pantser too. Yeah, I, it describes <laughs> it pretty well. So that makes a lot of sense. So, okay. So Troy, you, you know, you talked about, you always got three to five things going on. What you got going on? Well, um, well now, right now, nothing because it's Christmas, but it's not going to be long. You mentioned it when we were starting that um, we're going to have tickets for the Haunted America conference going on sale in early January the 9th. Um, and that is our biggest event of the year. Uh, we've been doing this. This will be our 26th year for the conference. And um, we got a great bunch of uh, ladies this year. We have all, all our speakers, except for me, are women this year. So it's, it's an all-female uh, driven conference, and we're moving to a new location. We we always have it in Alton, Illinois, every year, which is kind of a base of our operations. That's I do a lot of tours and events, and we've got a you know a bookstore and all kinds of things right in Alton. But um, we've been having the conference there for years, and we decided to move it to a much larger location with better seats. I mean, like actual theater seating. We've we've just always had it in you know. Uh, conference chairs, uh, wedding chairs, you know what I mean? And that that gets sore after a while. So <laughs> we are going to be an actual uh, theater seats. Uh, we've got 900 seats. we got a vendor room twice the size of our old one. It's going to be a great year, and we're super excited about it. So um, it is June 23rd and 24th of 2023, and uh, we're, we're right in the middle of the country. We get people who come in from, well, all over the place, but from the surrounding states especially because we're right in the center. So it's easy to get there from, you know, Missouri, Illinois, Wisconsin, wherever. Um, so we're excited about that. Um, in February is our annual Dead of Winter food drive. We've been doing this for, I don't know, 20-some years. Uh, we do a food drive in February. It's a free event. We'll have speakers and all kinds of things going on. We have it at the uh, the Haunted Mineral Springs Hotel in Alton, and uh, it's right across the river from St. Louis. And the only price of admission is to bring a canned good or non-perishable item. And then we donate those to food banks because by February, uh, all the Christmas generosity is gone. So the food banks are starting to run a little low. So we we have always just donated tons. I mean, it's people are great. They bring, they're, they're really, the, the people in the ghost community are really generous people and they bring tons of stuff. And uh, every year the, the people at the food banks are just lose their minds over how much great stuff they get. So we've got that coming up. It's February 11th. Um, and that's all on the website. Um, if you just go to AmericanHauntings.net, everything is on there. Uh, all the stuff that we do from the wintertime ghost tours that we do, the bus tours to uh, the dinner and spirits events that I do. So, yeah, it's we just I keep busy all the time. You know, I um, I, I I just. I don't know. I like I said. I I love doing what I do. So the more that I can entertain people with it, the better. So okay. it's, just, it's a blast. Okay. So before we wrap up, let's. Uh, I'll throw it at you. If sure. you could pick three books off American Hauntings Inc. 
that you think would be a great introduction to Troy Taylor, which ones would you pick? Um, well, let's not let's not go with the Christmas book that we're talking about because <laughs> let's be honest, in like a week, no one wa- is going to want that till next year. So, <laughs> I think that as far as just finding out what I do and what I like um, and what I write about, um, I would say um, I'm looking at books right now. That's mm-hmm. why I'm turning my head to look. I would say American Hauntings is the name of a, one of my titles. Um, it is the history of ghosts in American popular culture and how it affected American history. Uh, so it's a it's a big, thick read, and it's got a lot of entertaining stuff in it from, you know, the, the Fox sisters through the Amityville horror and TV shows and all that kind of stuff. So it, that's got a little of everything. Um, another of my favorites is um, uh, maybe Beyond the Grave, which is a okay. book I wrote about haunted graveyards, and I really... Uh, that's one of my favorites. It's just a fun book to write. Um, and so it, it just tells a lot of different stories. Um, Without a Trace is one that would cover kind of my true crime interests because that's a book about unexplained and unsolved disappearances. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that's one that I think that a lot of, I mean, it's it's one of my most popular titles. People love it just because it's just I mean, there's no answer to any of it other than the, you know, what explanations I try to give it. Um, And I'm also going to throw in a forlorn hope, which is my book about the Donner party. Just because because that's one of my favorites. Um, I do a (laughs) dinner. I do a, I know I do a dinner about the, the Donner party. uh, I know at the end of every uh, January and late January, it's, um, it's, it's dinner with the Donner party. And, you know, I tell everybody to bring an appetite, you know, uh, you know, know what'll be on the menu kind of thing but it is it is um it is that's just one of my favorite books personal favorites that i've written so and there's a i, mean, I don't know there's a lot i mean it's people ask me oh what's your favorite book and i go i don't know what are you interested in because i really just write what interests me and so it's really one of those things where you have to know what is good to you. What do you have an interest in? Because I've probably written something about it, or I, at least I will at some point if I have it yet. Uh, but yeah, so I just, that's kind of the, you know, direction I like to steer people. So. Okay. And should someone want to get a hold of you, book you to speak, say at their conference, how would they get a hold of you? Um, the easiest way is, um, you know, you can email me through the website, which is uh, AmericanHauntings.net, or just look me up on Facebook or Instagram or whatever. I, I've got a, um, you know, a pretty big author page. I post every single day, multiple times, usually about, you know, whatever is happening in the weir- world of weird and true crime things. I do like a daily thing. And, you know, on this date in 1881, that kind of stuff. <laughs> Um, so I, I'm pretty easy to find on Facebook and Instagram, Twitter, ugh, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. But Facebook and Instagram for sure. Um, so yeah, I'm easy to find there, and that's probably the best way to reach me. Okay. So. And folks, uh, even though this is pre-recorded, we will be uh, broadcasting it live tomorrow yes. night. Uh, and Wendy Merle and I will be telling some of our favorite ghost stories in between the the segments of the show. But we'll put all of Troy's links in the chat while we're doing that. So no worries. And then Troy, stick around after this because we're at the end of the show, but I'm going to talk a little shop. Okay. Sounds good, man. (laughs) All right. Thanks for tuning in to Mystic Moon Cafe. Everyone have a lovely Christmas and holiday season, or in this case, a dark bleak. Yeah. A dark bleak holiday season, but you know, with, with good things too. And lots of food. That's the main thing. And spiked eggnog. Yeah. Yeah, There you go. Perfect. (laughs) All right. Take care. Thanks. So, okay, that was our little pre-recorded interview with Troy. I hope you enjoyed our real-life ghost stories. Um, I do, too. Yes. And, and Wendy, we, we have an extra special guest next week, too. We have uh, Rick Galtieri. He is a he writes urban fantasy and horror, and I just felt like he would really fit in with us because a lot of his things are... Bigfoot and and boars, you know, genetically altered boars and vampires and I love a monster. Nerdy vampires at that. <laughs>
Ed Ed's just it's highly entertaining. He is he himself is a very highly entertaining man. And he um, his dog just pulled out of a rather rough patch. And so he yeah, he, that that was why it was a little bit tentative there for a while. But he will be with us and um, it should be a really great and fun show. Mm -hmm. I would I would prepare, maybe have a nap in the afternoon if you can um it may go long <laughs> i'll have my coffee straight up there you go there you I'll go. have my espresso for that well folks thank you for uh, joining us for our extra long episode this yes. Week. yes and um you know have a good night don't let krampus bite <laughs> have a ghoul christmas all right take care all right bye, bye.